It's early August and the weather here in England has finally started to feel a bit more like summer. For the first time since June, I've resorted to sun cream and my trusty straw hat to take a nice long walk in the sun. Roaming around in nature was key to the concept of the sublime, which inspired Martin's favourite romantic poets. Samuel Taylor Coleridge in particular was a great walker and composed some of his most famous poems while on the hoof. Pun absolutely intended, as you can probably hear the gentle sound of horses snuffling in the background. My walk today has taken me through a local farm with a stables, and I've paused to admire the horses poking their heads over the doors and inhale the smell. Hay and manure might not be terribly appealing to some, but for me it's very nostalgic. This was one of my favourite walks when I was growing up, going through fields and lanes and passing two little old churches with views of the South Downs. I definitely get my best ideas while walking through the countryside and it's a chance to switch off and think without any distractions other than those nature offers. I mentioned the Romantics because today we are off to Westmoreland, home of the stunning lakes and tarns of the Lake District and inspiration to many writers. Horses do feature as part of today's story, but they're also the centre of the county's centuries-old horse fair. So saddle up and gallop your way down the flashing lane, then gather close around the campfire and listen in. Welcome to the Three Ravens podcast. There were three ravens sat on a tree, down a down, hey down a down. They were as black as they might be with a down. One of them said to his mate, where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to episode 19 of the Three Ravens podcast. I'm Eleanor Conlon and I'm wandering along the shores of Lake Windermere with a book of poetry in my hand, <laughs> not so lonely as a cloud, as I'm joined by my co-host Martin Vaux. Not a co-host of Golden Daffodils, perhaps. Oh, and you <laughs> flutter and dance beautifully. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We're almost halfway through series two, which I can't quite believe. I know. But we've been having a wonderful time learning about all those places we couldn't previously locate <laughs> and uncovering plenty of hidden gems of dubious fact and wonderful folklore. Mm -hmm. We released our newest Magic and Medicines episode last Thursday, which is all about love spells. So if you haven't listened to that yet, please check it out. And we'll be back with the best year this Thursday. Yes, we'll be exploring, although not attempting to replicate, I might add, the <laughs> eerie wailings of the Banshee. <laughs> we also released our Patreon exclusive about Haunted Pluckley. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. What a good time we had. We did, yeah. If you're looking for a romantic day out, maybe after trying some of those love spells, I don't know, <laughs> ghost hunting in Pluckley is a great <laughs> option. We also have some wonderful new supporters on Patreon to thank this week. Kim, Joe, Sheila and Marie, thank you for joining our Conspiracy of Ravens. All hail Kim, King of Patreon. All hail Joe, King of Patreon. All hail Sheila, King of Patreon. All hail Marie, King of Patreon. And if you'd like to join the fun on Patreon and see what we got up to in Pluckley and get access to lots of other exclusives like the Film Club, the newsletter and to have everything ad-free, please consider signing up for three dollars a month or six dollars a month at patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcasts now you can't see us but every time we say all hail king of patreon we do very dramatic arm gestures oh we do uh, which brings us great joy and i hope you can hear them through <laughs> yeah, your headphones the enthusiasm comes <laughs> over so eleanor today is the 14th of august is there anything to get excited about 14th of august should I be wearing a special hat or doing some sort of dance? Well, if you fancy it, we could join the members of the Roman Catholic Church in celebrating the Vigil of the Assumption. Well, that sounds serious. This is the day when it's thought that the Virgin Mary ascended to heaven. So kind of her heavenly birthday. Oh, I guess happy heavenly birthday to the Virgin Mary. What do we do? Do we throw her a party? Mm, quite the opposite, actually. It's a vigil day, which means fasting and Bible readings. And some Orthodox Christians actually fast for 15 days Ooh, prior to the Feast of the Assumption of Mary. Rubbish. And that includes sexual abstinence. Oh dear, that's, so, that's, not, gonna, that's not compatible with the Love Spells episode. <laughs> no. So if you don't fancy that, um, yeah. we could instead raise a nice glass of beer to St. Arnulf of Soissons, uh, who is the patron saint of Brewers 
and hot pickers. Now, this sounds more my speed. So, what did St. Arnulf of Soissons get up to? <laughs> he was born a French nobleman in 1040 and was first a career soldier before giving it all up to become a hermit in that classic way, <sighs> yep. which he managed untroubled for three years before being called to return back to his religious community to take on the role of abbot. This is a very common feature. It really does. Like... like- these people becoming hermits who are then so popular that people are like, no, 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 come back, stop being a hermit, come hang out. And they really don't want to. No, they're all reluctant. Arnulf really didn't want to. He oh, yeah. really wasn't up for it. And he tried to leave the monastery to go back to his <laughs> hermit dream life that he'd been living before. But a divinely sent wolf supposedly blocked his path and made him return to be abbot. <laughs> Move aside, Wolfie, I want to go into goblin mode. <laughs> no! <laughs> and um, possibly because he developed drinking problem after all this. He's often portrayed as a bishop holding a mash rake, which is a kind of beer brewing tool. Oh, really? Yeah, That's so really he's the patron saint of brewers. Oh, oh well. Not I... sure why. I can only assume that he drank to forget. Okay, well, cheers to St. Arnulf, I suppose. Cheers! Now, I fear the county criers are going to be much more interested in toasting St. Arnulf than a 15-day fast. <laughs> so, shall we jump in there quickly and get them to ring us into Westmoreland? Oh, <laughs> Westmoreland is a historic county and modern district in the northwest of England. It's bordered by Cumberland to the north, County Durham and Yorkshire to the east, and Lancashire to the south and west. It was historically spelt with an E in between the R and the L, but is no longer. So, explain, how can it be a historic and modern county? Well, because Westmoreland was its own county until 1974, oh. when it became part of Cumbria. Yeah, like Cumberland. Yeah, see. but now very recently, this year, in fact, it's become its own district again, known as Westmoreland and Furness. Ah. So congratulations, Westmoreland, on regaining your rights. Yes, actually, I came across this fact when I was researching Cumberland for episode 14. There's obviously quite a bit of crossover between the folklore because the regions are linked. So some of the places I mentioned were once in Cumberland, but are now in Westmoreland and vice versa. It gets a little bit confusing, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And uh, some of the interesting legendary creatures definitely do not respect county boundaries. <laughs> Tizzy whizzies, I'm looking at you. <laughs> well, the new Westmoreland's actually done quite well out of the deal because it now includes the whole area of historic Westmoreland, the Furness district of historic Lancashire, a small part of historic Yorkshire, and about a quarter of the area of historic Cumberland. Whoa. So the Tizzy whizzies can cover an even wider area, <laughs> really. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm assuming that this is a county that's rich in moorland. Is that a fair well, assumption? The Anglo-Saxon name for the area was West Moringaland, which uh-huh. does mean the land of the people of the Western Moors, classic Anglo-Saxon yep. imaginative naming there. <laughs> but it's actually more likely that the name derives from the county's mears, which can mean lake, sure, uh, yeah. but it can also mean boundary. How can it? Yeah. And so by about the 12th century, it was referred to as West Maryland or West Maryland. Oh, wow. Okay. That's really interesting. Yeah. I didn't actually know much about the county other than to <laughs> associate it, this is very obscure, with the character, the Earl of West Westmoreland in Shakespeare's Henry IV plays. <laughs> okay. He's this he's kind of steadfast bestie of the king who acts as a bit of a voice of reason. Sure. How about you? Oh, Any Westmoreland knowledge? Not a jittery jot. I mean, obviously doing the Cumberland research I encountered a little bit, but then was like, ooh, I can't really talk about that because that kind of needs to be an Elida's yeah, episode she's off doing. My West, tizzy wizzy boundary. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought before we start our journey around the wilds of Westmoreland, we should have something to fuel us. Have you ever heard of Kendall Mint Cake? Oh, I most certainly have. Is Kendall Mint Cake from Westmoreland? It is. Now, if you haven't heard of it, Kendall Mint Cake is a super sweet treat made of peppermint and sugar. It's intense. And the story of its creation is actually a bit whimsical. It has some similarities with the wonderful discovery of Worcestershire sauce, which we talked about. Apparently, it originated when Joseph Wiper, part of the confectionery company who made Glacier Mint, left the boiled sugar solution for the mints out overnight and it turned solid and cloudy in colour. Yeah. So rather than throw it away, Joseph decided to have a nibble and then had so much energy, he started producing it to scale. (laughs) I mean, it's amazing if you're going hiking or out on kind of a camping trip, isn't it? Yes. So much so that the Shackleton expedition actually packed loads of Kendall Mink cake (laughs) as an explorer's snack. Yeah. (laughs) We have a friend who just eats it. 
<laughs> but I find it too intense. It's like eye-wateringly minty. Yeah, it's a little nibble thing rather yeah. than a big chunk, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's still produced by three companies and it's one of the few peppermint flavoured things that I actually like. <laughs> Although I've got to say the one covered in dark chocolate is definitely my favourite. Oh, God, that's so intense. Oh, it's it's good. I did actually get some in Kendall when I was on tour there a few years ago. See, so real Kendall <sighs> mint cake from Kendall. I've got to say, as much as I appreciate its, its utilities, I've, it's not really something I would ever choose to eat except in an absolute emergency but if i do try an antarctic exploration (laughs) i'm definitely packing kendall mink (laughs) well if you don't fancy mink cake you might prefer a carton of the retro classic sugary drink umbongo Uh, yes please which was manufactured in milnthorpe in westmoreland ah that's so cool okay i'm gonna although it wasn't the 80s so technically it was cumbria at that point confusing (laughs) i'm gonna have to put some adverts from umbongo onto the blog just because they're so fun the umbongo adverts they're they're hilarious if if slightly culturally insensitive (laughs) wasn't it umbongo they drink it in the congo yeah they do yeah yeah (laughs) yeah pretty horrendous we'll have to add a disclaimer (laughs) if um if umbongo is a bit much you could also have a delicious bite of grassmere gingerbread, Ooh. which was made to a secret recipe. Am I right in thinking, actually, that Dorothy Wordsworth, sister of William, really liked the grassmere gingerbread? Yeah, Dorothy and William were both fans of the gingerbread, although they might not have been if they'd known the supposed origins of its creation. Oh. That is just too tempting. Tell me more. I've got to know now. So, <laughs> gross, actually. Apparently, the bodies of the dead in Grasmere what? were not buried in coffins until 1814. They were wrapped up in wool instead. I can't see how this is going to lead to cake, but I'm excited. <laughs> it's not as bad as you might be thinking. <laughs> and they used to be buried inside the church under the damp mud on the floor. Uh-huh. So the floor wasn't wasn't paved um, yeah. for quite some time. No, and it, it, it used to be much more the case that people would lay rushes. Wouldn't yeah, they? and the floor was covered in rushes and reeds which regularly needed changing to keep things fresh smelling shall we say uh (laughs) and uh, local children were bribed to regularly change the rushes by being given this gingerbread children so it was like a come and change the rushes above the corpses treat honestly young people they will do almost anything for sugar they will (laughs) and they still do (laughs) although today's dead are buried in a much more sanitary way the rush bearing ceremony is still celebrated today in Grasmere and Ampleside every 5th of August so we've just missed it Uh, that's St Oswald's Day in fact and there is a mural commemorating it in St Mary's Church in Ambleside, which is this pretty amazing. It's a, I think it's a 70s mural, so it's quite modern looking, sure. but it's sort of 16 panels of oh, this rush bearing. That sounds great. Well, I'll have to try and find a picture and, and put that on the blog as well. Yeah, that would be lovely. Going back to Kendall briefly, yeah. as well as mint cake, it was historically important for its manufacture of wool. And the town's motto is even the very snappy, Panis Mihi Panis which means cloth is my bread. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Pan is me, he pan I could get behind that. And yeah. it even had its own special wool cloth called Kendall Green, which also pops up in Shakespeare's Henry IV Part One <laughs> as the clothing worn by foresters. Oh, that's really cool. And there's also Kendall Castle, which was home to the barons of Kendall, and perhaps most famously, Catherine Parr, the last wife of Henry VIII. Boo! That's the boo <laughs> for Henry VIII, not for Catherine Parr. No, Catherine she, Parr was great. She was great. Yeah, we have time for her. <laughs> well, she was probably born there, although it's not certain, and definitely spent some time while she was growing up in Kendall. Okay. And her handwritten prayer book is actually kept at Kendall Town Hall. Oh, I'd like to see that. That yeah, sounds lovely. It's pretty amazing. She she was quite an interesting character. Well, she actually. was. She was a very gentle soul, but also super educated. Yeah. and had her own views on religion, which I'm not sure. Yeah, she was such Henry an interesting <laughs> personality. It's one of those sad things about Henry VIII's wives is often people just mash them all together as this like cue, mm. but actually as individual people, they're all very interesting, and what yeah. they did in their time is all. Very interesting as well, in my opinion. Yeah. Maybe we ought to do a Henry VIII special. Ooh. Although... Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, difficult. Yeah, I'll we'll leave that to David Crowther at the History of England Absolutely, podcast. Absolutely, <laughs> that's way more his wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> Historically, the county town wasn't Kendall, though. It was actually Appleby, Ooh, lovely, which was, man. isn't it nice, where the courts of the Assizes met. Okay. And there's an amazing castle there, Appleby Castle, which has a 12th century tower called Caesar's Tower. Ooh. And some other interesting buildings, too, including a really cool bee house. Um, I also discovered this just completely 
it randomly. It's home to a 17th century picture that I really like, but I'd only seen photos of. Oh, was that? I, I didn't realise it was there. It's a triptych called The Great Picture. Uh-huh. Good, good name. And it shows a family with portraits on the wall behind them. And I love it because it's got really wonderful depictions of historic clothing. So I was excited to find out that it hails from Westmoreland. Mm. And I think it's still there um, in Appleby Castle. And Appleby today is also still home to the four-day Appleby Horse Fair in June each cool. year, which probably started in the 18th century. And is one of the biggest traditional gypsy and travel affairs in Europe and still features horse washing in the River Eden. Oh, that sounds And the fun. classic kind of flashing lane where the, yeah. they race the horses to show them oh, off. Oh, that's nice. I feel like you, you breezed past two interesting things there. One, <laughs> Caesar's Tower. Any evidence it had anything to do with Caesar? It had nothing to do with Caesar. <laughs> it was built in the 12th century. And they was, just named it in a really grandiose cool. way. And you said bee houses. Are we talking about like traditional apiaries or is there actually a full-on house that's just been dedicated to keeping bees in it? Uh, the latter. What? There's a whole house dedicated yeah. to bees? It's a really cool bee house with an interesting roof. No way. Yeah. That, that sounds great. So um, you also mentioned Ambleside a moment ago. Wordsworth, if I remember rightly, was the distributor of stamps for Westmoreland. Wow, what an amazing job title. Well, distributor y- of stamps, I love that. You may think so, but Percy Bysshe Shelley definitely didn't. He wrote a slightly <laughs> salty sonnet about it, essentially ripping it out of Wordsworth for selling out and getting a government job at Ambleside. <laughs> <laughs> well, Westmoreland was obviously a bit of a, a hub for the romantics in their circle. Yeah. I know that the social critic John Ruskin was also a Westmoreland local. He lived near Coniston in the 1870s and is actually buried up there in the churchyard. And of course, we've got to mention Beatrix Potter, who lived and worked in the Lake District and was inspired by the natural world and the hypocrisy of polite society to tell her tales of animals. Yeah, I mean, I think part of why people liked up there was it was kind of unspoiled nature, but it was also really cheap. So if you're an artist, you could move Mm. there and live there and it wouldn't cost you the world. I mean, we also talked a bit about this in the Cumberland episode, but it seems quite likely that Mrs. Tiggy Winkle might have been inspired by the tizzy wizzy. It must be. Um, But (laughs) Eleanor, tell me, aside from the occasional helpful hedgehog doing the laundry, uh, what else might we see if we visit historic Westmoreland? Well, we could visit the Devil's Bridge in Kirkby Lonsdale, which features a fun twist on the old Devil Bridge building legend. Apparently, a woman wanted to cross the River Loon, so the devil appeared and offered to build her a bridge. Uh-huh. This seems suspiciously helpful for our old pal the devil yeah, what's until he, he presented his invoice for the work, price of the bridge, the first soul to cross over it. Ooh. But this woman got the better of him by chucking some bread over the bridge so that her dog chased after oh, it. No, poor dog! Well, I like to think that the dog just belongs to the devil now black shark it's black shark (laughs) sitting by the hellfire barking at the demonic delivery driver (laughs) oh another theory is actually the black shark one that the dog could have turned into the legendary capelthwaite oh now i briefly mentioned this in the cumberland episode but said eleanor is more of a westmoreland thing so tell us about the capelthwaite it's a big black dog fiend classic which runs around westmoreland but it it seems to be quite benign unlike some of its cousins. So it's, it's got its close cousin, the Bargest, who yeah. hangs around in that area as well. But the Cabblethwaite doesn't presage death if you encounter it. Oh, that's I, a relief, it, I, I think it, it literally just runs around <laughs> looking scary. And I've got to ask, have we got any other sinister, phantasmagorical creatures just padding around Westmoreland? How about Thomas the Tank Engine? Excuse me? No, seriously. <laughs> so, the Island of Soda, yeah. which is the fictional isle where Thomas the Tank Engine books are set, yes. is based on the Isle of Walney, just off the coast of Westmoreland. <laughs> And that is not... <laughs> I'm not sure you can say that Thomas the Tank Engine is a folkloric creature. <laughs> you said sinister and phantasmagorical. <laughs> Have you looked into the depths of those train eyes? <laughs> I mean, he is, he is a kind of terrible mismatch, isn't he, of, of parts, like a living train. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think there's something in this. <laughs> stuck on tracks forever. It's like a metaphor, he can't escape. <laughs> See, you're into it, aren't you? <laughs> well, that's not Walney's only claim to fame either, because okay. it also features in the super catchy song, The Cock Fight, which oh. we will put on the blog so you can oh, listen. No. I'm still singing Twiddle and Twaddle. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thomas and his trained friends are a bit too much of this earth. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> Here's a tale of some malicious fairies around the Old Man of Coniston, which is supposedly Britain's most climbed mountain. Okay. The story goes that a local miner was shown the best place to dig under the old man's surface on the condition he didn't tell anybody else. Uh -huh. Well, one night after a few drinks, he did reveal the location. But the next time he went mining there, the fairies blew up one of his kegs of gunpowder, sealing the mine with him inside it. And you can still see the place where it blew up today. It is called Simon's Niche. Oh, it's called Simon. That is ghastly. I guess don't annoy the fairies of Westmoreland. No, they are a rather more baity bunch than some of the fairies we've encountered. <laughs> There's another story about Eden Hall near Penrith and a very beautiful enamel and gilt cup they owned. Ooh. Supposedly, the fairies took a shine to this lovely cup yeah. and demanded it. But the butler wouldn't hand it over, so the fairies cursed it with these words. Whene'er this cup shall break or fall, farewell the luck of Eden Hall. Oh, that's really interesting. Which obviously beggars the question, did the cup break? It did not. Ooh. It is on display in the Victoria and Albert Museum. No way! Eden Hall definitely lost its luck, though, because it was demolished <laughs> in the 1930s. Oh, no. Yeah, I think there's only a gatehouse <laughs> remaining. <laughs> I love that the, the family, though, are sufficiently spiteful to say, fairies, no, we are going to make sure this cup is pristine. <laughs> it's really lovely. Um, I think it's it's of Islamic origin, oh, okay. and it's it's colourful, it's beautiful. You can go and, go and see it. Um, cup stories actually seem to be another feature of Westmoreland myth. Um, here's a quite a good one with a ghostly twist. Oh, I thought it was about time we had a ghostly visitation. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> There's a tale about Calgarth Hall, which is on the shores of Lake Windermere. Yeah. It's a beautiful house and it was once owned by a Mr. and Mrs. Cook. Unfortunately, a greedy local magistrate called Miles Philipson Ooh. also quite fancied the house. So he planted a stolen silver cup in the belongings of the cooks. Yeah. And they were arrested for theft and oh. sentenced to death because it was a really expensive cup. Miles Philipson, you cad. Yeah, he was a cad. And he managed to get his hands on the house as well through some sort of legal wheeler dealery. Naughty. But before she died, Mrs. Cook put a curse on Calgarth Hall, well, as well Cook. she might. Yeah, well, on the anniversary of the cook's death, two skulls inexplicably appeared in the house. Ooh. And if they were moved, they would reappear. So no if Philipson way. tried to get rid of them, they would just come back and they caused havoc in the house, sort of things flying around and falling over. Ooh. Eventually, they, they got an exorcist in. Yeah. But they bricked up the skulls behind a wall on the property. So they're still there. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I've actually got goosebumps from that one. Don't know why I found it so effective, but that has spooked me out. I am not sure about randomly appearing skulls. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps you'd like some nice shiny treasure instead. Just these. <laughs> there are some good Saxon hoard discoveries in Westmoreland. Okay. The Kirk Oswald hoard has some amazing coins of early kings. I've heard of Yeah, yes, loads yes. of different kings. And the Penrith hoard is a big collection of silver pen annular brooches Ooh. including this really beautiful one that looks like a thistle oh lovely it's, it's very delicate like you could totally wear it oh well i would if yeah I had you would it. on your cloak yeah <laughs> penrith is actually quite interesting in itself um richard iii lived at penrith castle oh, for a bit yeah. and he's also thought to have stayed in what's now the gloucester arms pub oh, okay. that used to be a sort of coaching house i sure. think um and at st andrew's church in penrith there's two monuments known as the giant's grave and the giant's thumb oh they have a giant's thumb. I mean, that seems seems a little <laughs> cruel and unusual to me. <laughs> it's actually a damaged Anglo-Norse wheel-headed cross. Oh, okay, that's fine then. But the giant's grave is supposedly the burial site of Owain Caesarius, a legendary king of Cumbria, yeah, who was Owain, apparently a giant. Owain, yeah. I mean, I keep thinking maybe we need to do a little episode for Patreon all about him because he's a very interesting character in the folklore of the area. Yeah, mm. that could be definitely a good topic, wouldn't it? Yep. Well, his grave is really cool. It has two pillar crosses and four hogback gravestones, so it looks really unusual. I've never seen another grave that looks like that. Yeah, it's a stunner. I mean, there was quite a lot of Norse presence in Westmoreland, wasn't there? Yeah, definitely up there. The Vikings settled. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually see a really amazing example of this at St. Olaf's Church in Westwater because the roof's actually made out of a Viking longship. What? Yeah, so basically the settlers dismantled their ships and hauled them across the land and then used them 
this yeah, timber. Yeah, I knew, I knew about that. It's something a little bit Noah's Arky in it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, this kind of the ship of Christ. Yeah. It's really cool. I love the idea of seeing Vikings dragging ships across mm. the land. I mean, I would have loved to have been there to just like watch that happen. would have been incredible. Not to drag the ships yourself. Oh, though, no, no, no. I would have stood back and go, good work, everyone. Keep it up. <laughs> We could also take a trip to Podnet Tarn, a tranquil and beautiful lake, if we could find it. Excuse me? This could be a challenge because it was missed off the Ordnance Survey map in the 80s. When they're doing the <laughs> Ordnance Survey of the area, they, they just didn't just find it. For, just forgot. We can find it, so just didn't include it. <laughs> well, I guess that's one way to make sure an area remains unspoiled yes, for all time. absolutely no chance of tourism. <laughs> and it's actually not the only secret place. There's Ooh. Ons Barrow Tarn, which is high on a hill called Topper Cellside. Yeah. And it's guaranteed to be pretty deserted because hardly anyone knows it exists. <sighs> and there's sort of two aerial photographs well, of it. Shh. Let's not tell anyone. No, no. It's Three not Ravens there. community. <laughs> That's the pod Keep it tarn. secret. Keep it safe. Don't mention it to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it actually sounds like the perfect setting for a story, doesn't it? Doesn't it, though? Mm. Mm. Oh, you're <laughs> saying that as if there is a story. Is that what's happening this week? I, I have included it. Oh, cool. All right, great. <laughs> uh, there are so many interesting things to talk about in Westmoreland. I was worried that I would uh, not have much left after Cumberland, but there are loads of cool things. Well, that's great. I think I will leave you with the myth about Era Force. Era Force? That sounds like an 80s cartoon or a 90s cartoon. <laughs> it does. We it's... are the Era Force. <laughs> Actually, a lovely waterfall flowing towards Oldswater, which has a rather sad legend attached to it. Ooh. They say there was a knight called Sir Eglamore who was betrothed to Lady Emma of Era. Yeah. But he spent lots of time away from her, off on his adventures, ah, doing, doing nightly knights. things, I you know. Don't know. And she missed him so much that her health started to fail and she started sleepwalking. Aww. So sort of wandering around in her sleep, I uh, wandering far Lady and Emma. wide oh, yes, no. to visit places which had been special to her and Sir Eglamour, yeah. all while fast asleep. And one night she roamed right up to the edge of Era Force in her sleep. By a complete coincidence, that was the night Sir Eglamore chose to return from his travels and he arrived to see her standing at the waterfall's edge fast asleep. Oh, no. He tried to wake her up by touching her shoulder, but unfortunately... Oh, no, 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 this sounds terrible. I'm afraid so. But the story did inspire Wordsworth's poem, The Somnambulist. Oh, okay. Martin, would you do the honours? Oh, with pleasure. Um, okay. Soul shattered was the night nor knew if Emma's ghost it were, or boding shade, or if the maid her very self stood there. He touched what followed, who shall tell? The soft touch snapped the thread of slumber. Shrieking back, she fell, and the stream whirled her down the dell, along its foaming bed. Oh, thank you so much. That's, That's so definitely sad. got me in the mood for a romantic tale. Oh, excellent. Let's hear it. <laughs> so I'll start spinning my yarn right after this. In the darkest days of autumn, when the land was falling into slumber and leaves tumbled from the trees and flecks of ash from the bonfires tumbled up and the hearth was a safe haven from the bitter cold, and stories danced in the flickering candlelight and turned the shadows on the wall into leaping figures. Time slept. There was a soldier who fought in the war band of his king. He bore the blood-red rowan shield and it had always kept him safe. Before the company had ridden out, the auger had blessed their shields with runecraft so they would be protected in battle. But the leader of the war band they fought bitterly against had prayed to his gods for a rain which would last two hundred days and would wash the rune words from the rowan shields. The sky cracked and the rain howled and the tide of the battle turned. The two sides met on an open moorland, wide as woe and open as a mouth to the pitiless sky. The battle was a horror of whirling axes, of lopped limbs and cries of agony. And in that battle, the soldier took a terrible wound. He felt it rip through him, fire and ice and darkness, all at once. It could not be called desertion when he dragged himself away from the fight, fainting over the back of his horse with his grey hawk and parcel of grey hounds following behind. The fight was lost, the king run through and pinned to a tree, 
and the dead would fill many a waiting barrow. The soldier did not turn his horse for home. The home had already been burned, and there was nothing left for him but to die. Cold was the crack of the crow's cry as they wheeled and circled around him as he rode, and he knew he would be their carrion soon, for they could smell the dark blood seeping from the wound in his chest. The forest was dark with the black skeletons of trees which latticed the windows of the sky. His horse's hoof prints showed his passing only for a moment before leaves hid them. Mirroring and repeating paths confused his dying sense. His blood fell like drops of cinnabar, spilt from a nudged inkwell, spotting his horse's neck. He was carried into a clearing where a huge black raven sat on the withered stump of a tree. It had a wicked beak and a bright, inquisitive gaze. The soldier tried to sit up in the saddle, he knew it would take out his eyes with a vicious stab of its beak if it thought him dead. But his blood fell onto the tree stump, and the raven dipped its head and put the tip of its beak into the blood, and it was given language. Nor water nor oil will clean your wound, only the witch of Westmoreland. Dark spots swam before the soldier's eyes, but he asked the raven what it meant. The bird told him to ride on through the night towards the brightest star which hung low over the hill they called Arnsbarrow, and there he would find the witch who could heal his wounds. So the soldier rode on through the forest and towards the brightest star, sitting on the brow of Arnsbarrow like a coronet. His grey hawk kept the skies over his horse's head until it suddenly dived down into the grass. The soldier heard a shrill cry and then the baying of his greyhounds as they eagerly loped to join the hawk. He saw that they had captured a struggling mountain hare with a lily-white coat which lay pinned beneath the hawk's talons. The soldier would not begrudge them a meal, but then the blood from his wound dripped down onto the hare's spotless pelt and it spoke as the raven had done. Why do you ride in a hurry this way? when you'll be dead before break of day. The soldier told the hare that he sought the witch who could heal his wounds. Gesturing with its long back leg towards the clump of trees below the bright star, the hare directed him towards a secret mere, hidden from sight by a thick forest, and told him that there he would find the witch. Cold was the soldier and tired and faint, he kept his eyes open and his hand pressed over the piece of broken spear in his chest, even though he was losing blood faster than he could keep it in. He reached the edge of the hidden tarn at last, and its surface glittered with the reflection of the bright star above it, making a mirror of the water. He saw no witch, he saw no soul at all, except for an owl which sat in the branches of a willow tree and called its mournful sound. The soldier could not reach the owl, but his faithful grey hawk touched its wings to his bloody hands and flew up, up towards the owl, where it brushed its feathers with the soldier's scarlet blood until it too could speak. Where is she? cried the soldier. Where is the witch who can heal my wound? And the owl hooted in reply. Gather the goldenrod growing here and throw its blooms into the mere. The greyhounds helped the soldier to gather the bright fronds of goldenrod, bringing it to him in their mouths, and when they had enough he cast them into the sparkling mere as the owl had told him. The flowers sank beneath the surface of the water, disturbing the reflection of the star in bright ripples, and from the very centre of the star up rose the form of a beautiful woman with black hair all slick from the water. But as she emerged from the mere, the soldier saw that she was only a woman to the waist. Below was the body of an ebony black mare, glistening wet and ready to run. And run she did, faster than ever horse did run before. The soldier took the horn from his belt, and with almost his last breath he blew a blast on it. His horse and his hounds and his hawk knew well the signal, and they gave chase at once. The horse carried him towards the woman who was a mare, 
and the greyhounds shot off to tangle themselves around her hooves. High overhead, his hawk flew, screeching directions as they gave chase to the witch who could heal the soldier's wound. They dashed through the forest until at last the soldier's hounds and horse held the witch trapped against the trunk of a vast oak. But the woman, who was a horse, held out her hands towards the soldier. Stop, she said. We are far from the battlefield, so now lay down your rowan shield. In wonder, the soldier lowered his shield, and he watched as the part of the witch that was a mare melted away, leaving behind a whole woman in a blue dress which shimmered and clung like the waters of the mere. The soldier half slid from his horse and into her waiting arms. The witch took a frond of the goldenrod, twisted into her rippling black hair, and packed it tightly into the wound in his chest. At first it burned like hellfire itself, but then a warmth spread through his pierced body like the healing warmth of the sun. Once she kissed his bloody lips, and twice, and thrice, and by the time the third kiss was finished, his wound was healed. The grey hawk hooded its head beneath its wing, and the greyhounds lay down to rest, for all that night the soldier lay with the Witch of Westmoreland on a bed of crushed bracken. The next morning she gave him three kisses once again, and whispered in his ear that he would never be sick or be slain, not so long as he lived, for he had spent the night with her. And then she changed again, her back lengthening out until she was part mare, and she galloped back into the mere, where she vanished below the water. The soldier called to his hawk and hounds, and spurred his horse, and away he rode, leaving behind the secret lake at the top of Arn's Barrow, and the creatures who'd guided him there, and the mysterious witch of Westmoreland. Long was his life, and valiant, for he lived to fight for new warlords, and proved himself a hundred times a hero. In all that while he was never sick, nor did he sustain a wound, even though he threw himself headlong into fights which others scorned as madness. But he had no family, no friends, no kin to call his own, and the years passed by until the soldier was an old man, still strong and hale, but grey-bearded and lonely as the solitary wind. Age scarcely withered him, and he went on and on in this way until he was weary of life, but had no hope of death. And so he vowed to return to the Witch of Westmoreland, and ask her to lift the charm she'd placed over him, the gift which was beginning to feel like a curse. His horse and his hounds were gone to their graves, and his hawk was long since freed to the wind, so he had no company on his journey. It was All Saints' Day when he set out for the west to follow the light of the brightest star to the top of Arnsborough. It seemed that even the star's light had waned to a dull and sickly gleam in the mere. With shaking fingers, the soldier bent to gather an armful of the withered goldenrod which grew around its banks and sprinkled it into the water. The head which rose from the mere was no longer ebony black, but white as a winter sky, and the coat of the black mare was flecked with grey and silver and the eyes of the Witch of Westmoreland were tired from many years resting below the lake. You can heal all wounds, said the soldier. Can you heal the wound of loneliness and a too long life? The witch stamped her hooves on the ground and swished her silver-streaked tail, and then she took the soldier in her arms and swung him up onto her back. And the soldier took the horn from his belt and with almost his last breath he blew a blast on it. Over the rolling mists on the lake's surface a brace of ghostly greyhounds came running, kicking up enough ripples to make the reflection of the star in the water just as bright as it had ever been. Above the soldier's head, streaking through the foggy clouds, the ghostly hawk flew down like a silver arrow and perched on his shoulder. Once the soldier kissed the Witch of Westmoreland, and twice and thrice, and by the time the third kiss was finished, she was galloping away over the lake into the sky, fast enough to heal any wound. In the darkest days of autumn, when the land was falling into slumber 
and leaves tumbled from the trees and flecks of ash from the bonfires tumbled up and the hearth was a safe haven from the bitter cold and stories danced in the flickering candlelight and turned the shadows on the wall into leaping figures. Time awoke and span its wheel once more. So, Martin, if you were wounded, would you seek out the Witch of Westmoreland? Well, obviously, yes, I would. What an amazing character and what an amazing story. absolutely loved it. It had all these beautiful fantasy elements that I really appreciated. Obviously, kind of folkloric magic going on. I don't know. I found it quite spellbinding. So, oh, yeah. I'm so glad. It's lovely. So, the thing about this story is it actually comes from a folk song. Whoa. Rather than a true legend of the place. But, I mean, I assume the folk song must have come from somewhere. Sure. But that's the origin. But I just really liked the idea of a witch who could transform into a horse. Like yeah. A centaur witch. I thought it was quite unique. Well, I did wonder if they were going to fall in love. I was like, how's that going to work? Oh, she can transform. All right. All right. Yeah, no, she, <laughs> she doesn't stay a horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it reminded me quite a lot of Keats' poem La Belle Dame Sans Merci, this idea of sort of travelling out and having this experience with a kind of magical female elfin presence from which you can never recover. You're never the same afterwards. I thought yeah. that was interesting. I really liked the idea of it affecting his his whole life, yeah. his experience, because the original folk song literally just ends with him leaving her. Really? Yeah. But there's another one which um, somebody else wrote as a sort of sequel where he goes back. Oh. And so I really wanted to include the idea of him returning. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that that's one of the finest bits of the story because... It's one of those interesting moral conundrums that comes up in folk tales and plays mm. and novels and so on and so forth. You know, who wants to live forever? Who wants to live forever? You exactly. Know, we, we all have this idea of life being something that should endure, but actually there's a point at which it stops mm. being quite as pleasant. But only if it's worth living. Yeah. You know? Sure, if you've got a family and your life's very pleasant and fulfilling, but it seems like this character's life was just a series of wars. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. even his animal companions have passed away. Another aspect of the story I really liked, of course, was not just his animal companions, but like the animal guides. Yeah. Um, I really like the sense of like nature encouraging or helping on a quest, sometimes hindering on a quest, not in this story. But uh, but yeah, I like the idea of having these little sort of touch points where he speaks to this animal and it represents something and speaks to another animal and it represents something. That was really lovely. Oh, thanks. Yeah, obviously, I love animal stories and sort of animal guides. I try also, I try to kind of give it a slightly Saxon setting or an Anglo-Norse setting, I suppose, which. Which um, isn't in the story, but I thought that could be quite interesting given the context of Westmoreland. Oh, yeah, definitely. And um, use those kind of ideas of rune magic. You've got to love a rowan shield as well. A rowan shield is a wonderful symbol. (laughs) Well, rowan is this this sort of mythical word, isn't it, which uh, represents the boundary between magic and humanity. Yes, um, so it's kind of the Rowan Shield is, is the guide, I guess, yeah. the uh, the key to get to the witch. I love all of the properties of different woods associated with the Druids. And, oh, it's so interesting, uh, isn't it? Various Celtic different tree magic. Yeah, <laughs> it's so interesting. Oh, thank you so much, Eleanor. It was a really beautiful story. Thank you. Oh. So, correspondence. The first thing to say is do please swing by the Three Ravens shop at threeravenspodcast.com and check out the new merchandise there. We have original red Three Ravens things, summer plumage yellow Three Ravens things and loads of other goodies. Including cards from our Three Ravens card contest. And they're so beautiful. They They come out really nicely. Yeah, please do flap your night dark wings over to threeravenspodcast.com and consider making some purchases. Also, do please keep the entries coming for our second card contest yes. uh, please send jpegs of your original artwork please artists of any skill level it's on the theme of the folklore of winter yes, yes. and you can send those over to three ravens podcast at gmail.com and also please send us emails in general there like this message we received from louise who wrote hi martin and eleanor i discovered your wonderful podcasts on spotify the other day i'm a new zealander of british descent mainly cornwall norfolk and northumberland and your podcast is pure joy 
for me. Enjoying learning more about each county too. Great stuff. Oh, that's so nice. And we have had three more reviews this week. Yeah. Uh, this one was from Osika521 on Apple Podcasts, who wrote, Simply Wonderful. I first heard about the Three Ravens podcast a few months back while listening to Real Life Ghost Stories podcast. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. I love folklore from all over the world, but especially from the UK. Martin and Eleanor are fantastic writers and storytellers. I also love that the podcasts are close to an hour long. It's the perfect length of time to get in some weaving or knitting. <laughs> the stories are such a great mix of haunting, funny, silly and sweet to keep the great stories coming. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you. That's so nice. Thank and you, I love that you're weaving and knitting to the podcast. Yeah, that's gorgeous. exactly what we like to hear. <laughs> we also had a review on iTunes from Giant Ginger Fan who wrote a few weeks in and season two has been amazing so far. My absolute favourite is the storytelling, which both Eleanor and and Martin deliver so well. Best of all, become a Patreon. I'm <laughs> loving the bonus material and newsletter. Last but not least, we also had a review on iTunes from Up the LR who wrote, Great pod, really interesting podcast brought to life by Martin and Eleanor in a wonderful, not too serious way. Love the evocative background sounds too. Oh, thank you so much to Osika521, Giant Ginger Fan and Up the LR. Every review we get really does make a difference. And if you can find five minutes to hop onto iTunes or Apple Podcasts and review us, then we'd really appreciate it because ultimately it helps the podcast to reach new people. Speaking of which, thank you to everyone who's been active on social media this week. Yes. As you might have realised, we try and mention different names each week. Yeah. So even though you might be one of our most ardent supporters, and we do, of course, notice everything you do and we really do, appreciate really it, do. we try to make sure everyone gets a gronk from the Raven's Nest. Yes, yes. So we had a lovely message from Scott who tagged us in some photos of his recent visit to Stonehenge. It looked amazing. And thank you to Rachel and C.W. Reeve who also tagged us in their stories on Instagram. Instagram. And in terms of our likers, commenters and super sharers this week, we have to say special thank yous to Liam, Louise, Gary, Donna, Sabrina and Harry on Facebook, Fernwood Photography, Visiting North Yorkshire, The Chibi Chum and Ellen Dilda Fox on Instagram and Kim the Victorian Goth, Keir, Elizabeth Henry and the mighty David Crowther from the History of England podcast on Twitter or X or whatever we're meant to call it these days. Ah, yes, the mythic X. <laughs> Please do join us on facebook.com forward slash Three Ravens podcast, Instagram and threads at Three Ravens podcast and at Three Ravens pod on Twitter. And do please keep sharing us. We really do rely on everyone in the Three Ravens community to help us grow. We sure do. And also, if you would like bonus and extra content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Three Ravens podcast for $3 a month or $6 a month. New episode of The Film Club coming soon. Your witchy story had me quite excited for You Won't Be Alone, which is this month's Three yeah, Ravens Film Club can't film. wait to watch that one. I know, right? <laughs> so, Martin, where will we be wandering to next week? Ah, we are going to be deciding one of humanity's most important questions once and for all. Sounds intriguing. I'm, of course, talking about whether it's cream or jam first on a scone, because we're off to Devon County of the cream tea. Excellent. We will look forward to spreading our clotted cream yeah. correctly. <laughs> Until then, while our story's gone that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle until you're out of the woods. Thanks and credit go to Legends and Historical Notes on Places of North Westmoreland by Thomas Gibson, the Journal of Antiquities blog, visit cumbria.co.uk and oculumstorism.co.uk. Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour, and our logo was designed by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production, produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman, such hounds, such hawks, and such lean man, with a down, derry, 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 down, down.